All right, so you're there in 1 Samuel chapter 2. So we're starting a new series tonight called Train Wrecks in the Bible. So this is going to be an exciting series. We're going to look at um, different disastrous situations in the Bible and what we can learn from those situations. And tonight, we're of course looking at um, 1 Samuel chapter 2, which talks about um, the priest or the judge, Eli, who was the judge right before the final judge of Israel, which was Samuel. And we're looking at the state of Eli's temple. So the disaster, the train wreck in the Bible that we're looking at this evening is Eli's temple. Okay, and you say, Eli's temple? What are you talking about? Do you mean Ezekiel's temple? No, I mean the state of the temple, or actually the tabernacle in Shiloh, if you will, um, while it was under the charge of Eli the priest. So we saw the story here, and we're not going to focus so much on you know, the actual sons and what could have you know, gone wrong with Eli's sons. But basically, if you look down at 2 Samuel chapter 2, the Bible tells us what was going on in the temple during the time of Eli. And the Bible says in verse number 12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. That means these men were, they were not saved. They were not believers. They were just sons of the devil basically, is what the Bible is saying here. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was unseating with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand, and he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did at Shiloh unto the Israelites that came thither. And also they burnt the fat, the priest, when they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let him not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. So the Bible says here that the situation in the temple, if you look forward in verse number 22, the Bible says even more against what was going on. So basically the first part is talking about how they're basically just stealing from the people. They're stealing from the people, and it says that the Bible, you know, the, the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. People hated going and giving their offering to the Lord because these priests, they were supposed, like the priests were supposed to be um, sustained by the offering. They were supposed to be, you know, get a portion for themselves for their food to eat. But these guys were just taking whatever they wanted. They were gluttonous, and they were stealing from the people, okay? And it gets even worse in verse number 22, where the Bible says, Now Eli was very old, and heard all that his sons did unto Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So these men were, these two priests, sons of Eli, they were committing theft, they were gluttonous men, and they were also committing fornication with the, the people, the, the women that were coming to the door of the tabernacle of the, conversation, the congregation. They were, they were abusing their power in the church, in the temple, to take advantage of women and commit these terrible sins. So, in verse 16, go back to verse 16. You see how they say that I will take it by force. So they're obviously, they're stealing as well. So not only had sin entered into the house of God, but it was being committed by the leaders of the house, which is, you know, terrible. So what's the result of this? Look at verse number 17. It says, Wherefore the sin of the young man was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. So look, people hated being there. I mean, abhor means hated, right? So because of what was happening, you know, the people actually hated going to the house of God. I mean, what a terrible situation this, this is. Look at verse number 23 of, verse, of 1 Samuel chapter 2. So Eli tries to talk to them, right? He's going to fix the situation, right? So he goes and he says in verse number 23, And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all these people. And then he really gets, like, seriously serious with them right here. He says, Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. 
If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, you think, because the Lord would slay them. So that's an interesting statement there at the end, because the Lord would slay them. That's the same type of, of, uh, of statement that you see when, when God is talking about Pharaoh in Exodus during the plagues where you see things that say like and God hardened Pharaoh's heart that's the same type of statement right there so basically they would not hearken to the voice of their father because the Lord would slay them so basically their heart had been hardened God had already decided these guys are done they're toast I'm gonna take care of this problem myself you know God knew that Eli Eli raised these two boys I mean he obviously I mean we kinda of see his fatherly skills here I mean imagine you know your son is an assistant pastor of your church or whatever and and they're like committing all these horrible sins and you know you 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 as the senior pastor of the church go up to them and you're like nay my sons you know please don't do that right but look they were they didn't take him seriously they never did and God knew he was gonna have to fix this himself so I mean God at this point doesn't even want them to get right because he's going to slay them right so look of course the Lord then sends the Philistines against them both Hophni and Phineas the two bo the two sons are killed the ark is taken turn over to first Samuel chapter 4 first Samuel chapter 4 so the man of God obviously comes and prophesies you know against Eli and his family and we see that um, fulfilled in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and look down at verse number 11 where the Bible says and the ark of God was taken and the two sons of Eli Hophni and Phinehas were slain in verse number 17 Eli hears the news and in verse 17 the Bible says so a messenger this happens in the battle a met you know they're killed and then you know the ark is taken by the Philistines this is actually the same story that we read where the the Philistine general said quit ye like men and fight and they did fight and they they won and they took the ark it's the same story in the Bible okay that we talked about this morning but in first Samuel 4 look at verse 17 a messenger goes back to report the news and the messenger answered and said Israel has fled before the Philistines and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people and thy two sons also Hophni and Phinehas are dead and the ark of God is taken and it came to pass when he made mention, look, it's, it's interesting that Eli doesn't even care that his sons are dead, right? But it's like when, when he finds out that the ark is gone, when it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck break, and he died, for he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel 40 years. So here, you know, Eli's the, he's kind of this big old guy, and he, he, he just... He, he's so abhorred by the fact that the ark was taken that he falls backwards in a seat and he breaks his neck and he dies. Okay? So look, God did take care of the situation. But the point I'm trying to make is the state of Eli's temple was a mess. It was a terrible, terrible mess. I mean, it was a real train wreck, if you want to put it that way. I mean, think of it. I mean, think of it. There was one temple, right? So, I mean, there was one temple there. The people, I mean, the people had to go there. I mean, there was, no, there was no other place for them to go. They had to go there, and it was being run by these two men. And so God steps in and fix, fixes the problem. So that's the story. How can we apply that story? Well, let's apply, I mean, let's apply it to our temple today, okay? Let's apply it to our house of God today. Well, God was not to allow, well, he was not about to allow the situation in 1 Samuel to just go unchecked, okay? It's important that we recognize that, and it's also important that the main point that I want to get across on the story of Hophni and Phinehas is that what those two men did, what those two boys did, it made people hate going to the house of God. Okay, I mean, that is a super important lesson right there out of that. It made people abhor going there. I mean, it, it discouraged people. So let's look at, you know, our house of God and see what we can apply onto that. First of all, let's look, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's talk about, 
you know, um, sin in the church. Because God wasn't about to allow sin and chaos to infiltrate the house of the Lord. He just wasn't going to allow that to happen. So we get similar instruction in the New Testament on how we are supposed to deal with sin in, in particular in the church. Okay, Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such an one, know not to eat. For what have, I to do, what, what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do ye not judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So remember the boot series, right? We went through the boot series as one of the first things that we did in this church. Why, why was it one of the first things? I mean, it was one of the first things because I didn't want you to be offended when you saw something like that happen, okay? And look, it's already happened. So I didn't want you to be offended when, you know, the Bible says that these six sins are, you know, this list, look, it's a common list. It's a common list. I mean, fornication, I mean, uh, covetous people, idolaters, railers, drunkards, extortioners. I mean, this is a common, these are common things today. I mean, it's common. These six things are common. But they're not to be common here, see? Amen. We're not to allow them here. That's why we preached through that sermon, that sermon series, right away. Because we were going to operate differently here in a manner that you had probably never seen before in, in a church. Okay, go back up to verse number 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So, I mean, why? I mean, why take it so seriously? I mean, why, why these six things? Well, the Bible says in verse number 6, it says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little, little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I mean, because sin spreads like leaven. That's why. So, I mean, God gives us this list. I mean, how serious would preaching on fornication be taken if like half the people in the church that were sitting in the pews were like living with someone that they weren't married to? I mean, it would be a joke. It would be a joke. No one would even take it seriously. But actually, here's what actually really happens. All right, once you get a church where there's half the church that's living in fornication or just drinks or just is into all these sins, the, here's what really happens. The preaching on it just stops. That's what happens. Right? Because if I'm sitting here and I've got a church of 500 people and, you know, I can't, you know, they're drunks and they're in fornication and they're whatever else, they're railers and all these different things. Look, I, I can't preach all my people out the door. Who's going to pay the bills? Who's going to pay my bills? But the, Bi the Bible says that these things are not to be allowed at all in the church. Okay? So look, we're not going to stop the preaching on it here. And we're not going to allow it here. I mean, the preaching would be a joke if those things were allowed here. Right. I mean, it would be a joke. I mean, imagine, imagine if after the offering, just picture this in your head. Imagine if we took the offering and then the guys came up to the front with the plates and I just like grabbed like fistfuls and just started shoving it in my pockets. Like, I'm like, that's just the way we're going to do things from now on. You would abhor the offering of the Lord. It would make you hate the offering of the Lord. Nobody would ever want to come here if that was going on, right? So, I mean, look, sin in the church, it not only endangers people in the church, especially the younger people, but it can cause people to stumble in their Christian life. I mean, especially, you know, coming to church. Like, the temple was a little bit different. I mean, it was kind of like, imagine, imagine if all of Fresno was saved, I mean, just imagine, really hard, if all of Fresno was saved and there was one church that everybody went to, that was like the true church, right? I mean, that's kind of the situation that it was in Israel, right? In Shiloh. Like, everybody was kind of saved, they all worshipped the same God, and they all went to worship at the same tabernacle. But the leadership had just gone corrupt, right? What would actually happen here if we allowed all that sin to come into the church is you all would just go, you would just not come here anymore. Right? I mean, separated you know, Christians, they, you know, they had to keep going to the tabernacle. 
But honestly, if we just allowed sin to run unchecked in this church, it, we just wouldn't have separated Christians going to church here. It, it's that simple. That's why all the people in these rock concert church, you know, places around town, these big mega churches, they all, they act, they talk, they dress, just like everybody else. Because, you know, there's no difference, right? They talk the same, they live the same as the world. There's no difference. So if you allow sin in the church, that's the type of church, that's the type of people that you'll have sitting in the pews. It's, it's a guarantee. So, you know, we will hold the line here on sin. It's very, it's, look, it's very, this is, it, it's kind of easy for me because it's very black and white. We just won't allow things on that list here. Right? Because look, ultimately God, same God, ultimately God will step in and he will clean up the mess if, if we don't, if the leadership doesn't. Right? Because look, ultimately God cleaned up Eli's temple. He cleaned up that mess. Right? I mean, all these other churches, it doesn't even make, it's, there's no candlestick there. Right. right? We have a candlestick to lose here. Amen. You know, we don't want to lose the candlestick here. All right? So that's sin in the church, right? That's sin. I mean, that's an easy one, black and white, right? But wait, there's more. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you know, we're talking about people speaking in a church. They're talking about these people that are speaking in unknown languages. They're just getting up and they're speaking unknown languages. Nobody can understand them. So Paul is kind of preaching against that. He's saying, hey, you know, make sure there's an interpreter or don't do it. He's basically giving rules on orderly um, church practices, right? So, I mean, you're saying, oh, okay, you know, people speaking in, in foreign languages in a church that nobody understands? Who would do that? Well, I don't know, the Catholics. The Catholics did it for hundreds of years. They probably, you could still probably find a Catholic church somewhere in the world, maybe even in the United States, that gets up and has mass in Latin, you know? I mean, nobody speaks Latin. They're just up there and they're like, Hamalakalikam Ave Maria, right? I mean, nobody understands anything that's going on, and, and that's just what's going on. I mean, that, it, just, it just becomes normal. But look, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 that that is not orderly. That is not something you should be doing. It just creates chaos and confusion. I mean, imagine if I just got up here and just babbled words that you didn't understand every single day for, you know, every single service for an hour. You know, just so you could feel spiritual or something. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Look at verse 33 of 1 Corinthians 14. The Bible says this. It says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Verse 34. He gives more direction. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. So, look, I mean, that's, that's where we get that, that, you know, women don't amen in church. Say, do you not like women? No, but the Bible says. Just the women should not speak up in church, period. So that's why the men should say amen, the women should not in church. All right? It's not, I mean, look, how could a woman be a pastor if she can't speak in church. <laughs> what in the world? You know, so I mean, people just aren't reading the Bible. Okay? So like, if it's in the Bible, that's what we do. Alright? So look, he's just giving all these different directions on order in the church, how to do things, how not to do things. These people can speak, these people don't. Hey, if you speak this language, have an interpreter. I mean, he's just, he's like, God's not the author of chaos. Right? God is not the author of confusion. But then at the very end of the chapter, he makes a very profound statement. All right, so he's talking about some specific things, right? Speaking, how to speak, who can speak, all these different things. But then look at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40. The Bible says, then he says this, says, let all things be done decently and in order. Look, he's not just talking about speaking there. He says all things. I mean, that's a tall order, right? That all things should be done decently and in order in the church. That's a tall order. All right, so like, well, let's look at that. Let's look at order in the church. 
You know what? I mean, look, things need to be managed in an orderly way around here. So, like, let's let's tighten some bolts this evening. Okay? Look, we're gonna have you know a lot of visitors coming into town in the next few weeks. Let's tighten up some bolts. All right? Because look, the main point of this sermon, if you don't get anything else out of it, is that that disorder and not doing things in order, just like Eli's temple, will discourage others. And that is the last thing that we want to do, right? Remember the people, the men, they abhorred the offerings, right? People could hate coming here if we just have this disorderly church, all right? So let's talk about order in general. Let's talk about, let's just break it down. Let's talk about the church service, right? I mean, look, there's a reason we have an order of service here, right? There's a reason that we do it the same. I mean, you say, oh, the, the announcements again. Like, it's always going to be that way. It's always going to be the same way every time because it's supposed to be orderly. Now, during the service, you should be orderly as well, right? Especially, look, especially during the preaching, right? I mean, look, if you're over the age of four, you should be able to sit through a sermon without having to use the restroom several times, right? I mean, look, last Sunday night, when Brother Ryan was preaching, and I, I was kind of, I had a different perspective on it because I was sitting and I was listening. At one point, we had almost half the church up doing something. I mean, people were getting up and getting coffee. That is not okay. To just get up and like make yourself a cup of coffee during the church service. I mean, it's, it's very disrespectful to the preacher. I mean, it, it's not orderly. I mean, I, I mean, I've been sitting at security at Red Hots over the years, and like it's not really a problem at Verity because people are pretty well, you know, trained. But at the Red Hots, you just see like all kinds of people from all different places, and you get to see. I mean, people get up to, I mean, to to answer phone calls. People get up in services to use. I mean, 18, 19 year old kids use the bathroom like three times during church. I mean, like what what is wrong with you? You need to go to a doctor or something. You know what I mean? It's only 45 minutes taking phone calls, coffee, I mean, all this stuff. Look, it's disorderly is what I'm trying to get at, okay? During the service, the mother baby room. Let's talk about this. Look, the mother baby room is to be a training room, okay? It is a training room. Now, the things that it is not is it's not a playroom, okay? It's not a playroom. Look. Here's another thing that it's not. It's not a gladiator arena. I mean, last Sunday night, it sounded like there was a gladiator fight in there. I told my wife, like, is there horses in there too? I mean, there's, kid, I mean, there's people slamming into the wall, screaming. I'm like, I heard swords, ching, ching. You know, the crowds, Wah! I don't know what was going on, but it's like, look, it's, it's, the mother baby room should not disrupt the service itself, right? Because look what it tells me is this. It tells me that, that if, if it's that loud where we can hear it out here, that it's impossible for a mother to watch the service when she's in there. That's what it tells me. All right? Look, it, it, it's not orderly for it to be that way. It's a training room. All right? So the test is this. The test is this. Could another mother sitting, coming into the mother baby room, this is the test for the moms. Could another mother, like who's a visitor to the church or, or whatever, you know, or, you know, anybody, come into the mother baby room, sit down, open her Bible, and be able to watch the service with what is going on in there. Is that possible? And if it's not, something needs to be fixed. Okay? That's the test. All right? So, look, look, we have two-year-olds that sit in this church during service. I mean, we, I'm looking at two, three, and four-year-olds right now who are sitting in church, okay? I mean, it's possible. It's a training room. That's what it's used for. It's not a lunchroom either. Let's talk about food next, okay? Look, it's great that we have this large building. It's wonderful that we have this large building. People can hang out all day. But look, kids, you know, you should eat at a table here. If you're going to eat food, you should grab food. Look, you're like, man, you're being hard on me. Well, you know what? I just ripped my own kids for this today. All right? I don't want to see kids, you know, my kids especially, you know, just running around with a donut in their hand. And, and you just, because guess what? The donut just, I mean, you ever heard of this thing? Look, I, I told my kids today, look, we're not going to eat like we're a bunch of hyenas in this church. 
All right, you ever seen those like nature shows where there's like this deer carcass and all the hyenas and there's this like carcass flying everywhere. And all the hyenas are like, yip, 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 yip. And you're just flying. There's just car I mean, that's not how we're going to do things. Amen. So here's what you do. You want a donut? Here's what you get one of these things. They're these round things. They're called plates. You put one on the plate and you know, you sit down and you eat the donut in the plate and you use a napkin, you know? I mean, it's complicated, but this is what you're going to do. This is the non-hyena way of eating a donut, okay? So look, there's also this thing that you have to remember when you see like kids running around with a donut in their hand called, it's called the law of conservation of mass, okay? I'm going to explain that to you now. Somebody said today, this morning, that my sermons aren't funny enough, all right? So I'm going to do a magic trick for you right now, all right? I mean, I don't know how to take that. You know, when somebody comes up to me and they're like, you know, you're, you know, you're kind of you're like Pastor Anderson, except you're not funny. And I'm like, uh, uh thanks? <laughs> so I'm going to do a magic trick now. And I'm going to explain the law of conservation of mass. The law of conservation of mass means that matter, mass, cannot be created nor destroyed. But I'm going to make this donut disappear. Okay? You can't see the donut? Can everybody see it? Here we go. Gone. All right? You see that? But look, did I really make the donut disappear? No, I didn't. I threw it on the floor. Right? So when you see your kids running around with food in their hands, and all of a sudden they're running by five minutes later and they got no more food, you know, it didn't just disappear. It got smashed into something. You know what I'm saying? It's not orderly. I'm being funny, but I'm kind of serious. All right? So look, when you're done eating, like, look, people, we have tables back here. You know, people, you know, I've told the ushers at 4 o'clock, you know, let's, now let's get off the kids and onto the adults. I've told the usher at 4 o'clock, get us back into church mode. You know, go in and, but look, here's the thing. It shouldn't look like a fast food bomb went off in here, right? I mean, it's like, you know, boom, McDonald's bags everywhere. They're just created out of thin air, right? Look, all you have to do is sit down, eat, and then just leave the area like you left it. Just, just throw your bags away. That's it. That's orderly, right? Right? Look, kids eating off the floor, not decent, not orderly, not healthy. Okay? Look, this, stu this kind of stuff, it will discourage visitors. That's why I'm bringing it up. All right? People will see this and they'll just be like, man, there's just chaos here. Okay? Because to most people, it, that's not orderly. All right? So let's just, like, let's talk about kids' activities. Let's get back onto the kids. Look, we don't have a lot of rules here on purpose, okay? I want the kids to have fun here, and we've started, I, I've tried to do some management things to help, you know, create some order. We've had a table moved out here for the, for the medium-sized kids, the teen tables in the back, and then the table out here. For, I, I want to encourage kids to play board games here. I want to encourage kids to play chess. The kids can't play chess anymore because Every five seconds, there's, you know, little kids running and just ripping the boards off the table. It's extra, like, look, there's actually a lot of kids that are very frustrated about this in the church. So that's why we move the table out here. So we can keep an eye on our kids. So the kids can play a board game, they could play chess, they could do whatever. That's order, right? We want to encourage order, and we don't want to discourage them from order, right? So look, it, it's... I'd rather have them playing these games than running around like crazy people. All right? So, but, and, and here's the thing. You just got to keep, you just got to keep an eye on your kids. It, it's very simple. Right? I mean, here's the thing with training your kids. I mean, if you do it, if you train your kids, you don't have to watch them every second. All right? If you train your kids, you, I mean, that was kind of the beauty of the whole blinds thing. I mean, there's no easier training than the blinds thing. You touch the blinds, spanked. You know, you do that one time, two times, maybe three times, if you're spanking them right, trained, done. But look, or you can just constantly follow them around and be stressed all the time. You can just be like, uh, uh, you, know, no, you know, just do this whole thing all night long. I mean, whatever you want to do, but what's not going to work is not training them and then just being oblivious to what they're doing. That is the, the option that's not going to work. Okay? Because it, it, won't, it won't be an orderly situation ever. Okay? I almost hit you with the donut, brother. <laughs> Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 
You ever been hit by a donut in church? <laughs> Never. First Timothy chapter 3. You say, you know, we don't have, I mean, this is a lot of rules that you're bringing up. And we don't have these rules in our house. Well, I mean, let me just clear that up for you right now. And reassure you that I'm not here, remember last Sunday morning, I am not here, nor have I any interest in lording over how you do things in your house. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 15. The Bible says this, it says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtst to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Look, this is not your house. This is God's house. And it's, it's none of my business how you run your home. I can preach on it. I can give you counsel on it if you want. But ultimately, it is my responsibility on how things are done and that things are done decently and in order here. Okay? So look, we need to heed these things. We need to tune some things up here. I mean, many times over the last six months or even the last year, people have said, you know, man, you know, this church is going to be, you know, I can't wait till we're 100 people or we're 80 people or whatever. And I'm like, hey, you know, until we tune a few things up, I'm happy at 30 or 40. I mean, I can't imagine being 100 people and, and not being the, the right, you know, having things tuned up in the right. I don't want Eli's temple. I don't want to be running that type of situation. I don't want to have mass chaos. You know, we have, you know, a church service and just like everybody's getting up to get donuts and cookies and coffee and going to the bathroom 12 times and all this kind of stuff. And there's just chaos everywhere. Look, I, I, I don't want that. We need to tune things up so we don't have that. Then we can grow, right? We can show, look, and, and we can show that we can be good stewards of the blessings that God has given us. And then, you know, maybe he'll answer some prayers Amen. and grow this church. Amen. All right. And also, I mean, you, we have to think about, folks, we have to think about future visitors. You know, we have to think about, you know, what visitors will think when they come in here. You know, people are going to come in here and they're not going to understand what a family integrated church is. They're not going to know. We have to show them. We have to show them that, hey, a family integrated church means that we encourage these kids to sit here and listen. We encourage them to sit here when they're two years old. I mean, they listen. Do you know that they listen when they're two? You know, do you know that they hear what's going on when they're two years old? You know, I mean, you know, Dale hears what I'm saying right now. Amen. Dale, you just got called out in church and you're two. <laughs> but here's the thing. We need to make them understand what this means, that, that the kids need to hear the preaching, that the kids need to listen, and, and that the mother baby room is there for them to train their children. And, and it's not just this weird situation where they can't go in there because then they don't get to hear the preaching and they don't know, is it a playroom, is it not, it, it, what is it? Right? I mean, look, ultimately it's not hard to understand that if it's just like fun play uh, fight time in, in the mother baby room, why would I ever want to sit in church? I mean, why would I ever want to sit in church if it's just like party time, you know, when I go to the mother baby room? But that's not what it's supposed to be like, all right? It's training. It's training. So we're going to have to show, we're going to have to be the example. Because, like, the last thing we want is for people to come in here and to be like, oh, they were, they were a family integrated church, which meant that it was just chaos everywhere. No, that's not what we want, right? Because they'll look at, they'll look at the church that separates the children and takes all the children and, and tucks them in the basement, they'll look at that church and they'll be like, oh, that's orderly compared to what we saw there. But no, when you see a bunch of kids that are being trained properly and they're all sitting and they're like listening to the preaching, I mean, look, that's impressive. People come in there because that's not a normal thing today. It's not a normal thing for three, four, five, even five or six year olds to sit through church service and listen to the Bible being preached. It's not normal. Okay, but it's going to be normal here. Right? And that's our goal. So look, Eli's temple was a disaster that God had to step in and clean up. He was a weak leader. He wouldn't do anything. So God stepped in. But guess what? Same God that we're dealing with today. And God demands the same order. You know, and, and let me just, you know, let me just say some good news. You're like, oh, 
Thank goodness. <laughs> but look, I mean, we've seen several of you step up in the last few weeks even to help out with cleaning and showing up early to create order, the order that is needed before church and to help clean up the outside and to do all the, I mean, I didn't ask all these extra things to happen. It's just you all just doing it. And let me just say that none of that goes unnoticed. None of it. Okay. So look, it, there's a lot of good things happening, but we just need to tighten some bolts every now and then. All right. So look, we've been given very specific rules on things not to allow in the church. That's the easy part, right? I mean, no problem. I'll take care of that. All you have to do is just understand when it happens that we're just following what the Bible says, right? I mean, we've already done it. We've already done it. I mean, look, talking about, you know, this morning, I mean, do you think those are comfortable conversations? Do you think that those are comfortable conversations? When you have to tell somebody that, hey, you know, because of this, you know, we just can't have you in church here? You think that that's comfortable? That's not comfortable. Okay, it's not a, a great, I mean, especially when you're dealing with saved people, you know, these are brothers and sisters, and, and you have to have those types of conversations, but I will have those conversations every time, no problem. Amen. Okay? But we just need to also keep things running in a decent and orderly way. Because look, we want everybody here to love coming here. And that's, that's what it boils down to, right? That's the biggest takeaway of Eli's temple is that the people hated it there. Ah! Man, if I ever am in charge of a ministry or a church or anything where people hate it there, I mean, what am I doing? What am I doing? So these are the instructions that God has given us. You say, oh, you, you're picking it some, some nitpicky type things. Look, I nitpick my kids all the time. That's my job. Do the same. We have to be decent in an order in this house, right? This is not my house. This is not your house. This is the Lord's house. Amen. And we're not going to run it the way Eli ran his temple. Amen. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.